Okay, I'll call the regular council meeting to order. And Cornell City Council recognizes that we meet on the traditional territory of the Lataco Denny Nation. Uh, for those of us joining us tonight and for the public, uh, just a, a reminder to those who are on with us, the delegation uh, for uh, the Cornell Ambassador Leadership uh, Program, uh, we do record uh, council meetings and those recordings are available uh, to the public uh, as of tomorrow. Uh, so if you're just aware of that, we just want you to be aware that it is a recorded uh, session. Uh, with that in mind, uh, with respect to the agenda, I believe the only item we had was the late agenda item, the Barkerville letter. Uh, is that correct, uh, Ms. Hartley? We also have a SIP item that was brought forward. Oh yes, sorry, thank you. Councilor Paul brought a SIP item uh, forward, the letter from MP Doherty. Uh, so when we get to SIP, uh, we can address that item. Uh, with that, can I have a motion to approve uh, the agenda? Councillor Rudenberg, so moved. Councillor Vic, second. Anyone opposed? Seeing none, that motion has passed. An adoption of the regular minutes of March 2nd. A motion to adopt. Councillor uh, Elliott, Councillor Goulet, all in favor? Councillor Paul, you've got a comment? Yes, I do. Uh, I think uh, um, an amendment is in order. If we go to page seven of 61 and in particular resolution 21 12 uh, 122 the record should indicate that uh, councillor goulet left the meeting at that point thank you councillor paul yeah no that's correct good catch councillor paul thank you so uh, the motion will be then as amended, as per Councillor Paul's uh, suggestion. Uh, anyone opposed? Seeing no opposition. Again, thanks, Councillor Paul, for that clarification. Okay, Rose, could you pop on and show us your live uh, feed, please? Where, there you are. Hello. Good How are you? How are you tonight? I am well, thanks. Rose, uh, I'm going to ask you to do the individual inter introductions this time for uh, our 2020 ambassadors and then for each of the candidates sponsors, uh, just because I don't want to uh, distort the pronunciation of the names and because you'll know we've got our own list here, uh, but you'll know the list and I know there's one correction for one of uh, the sponsors. So if you would do that for us, then I would just turn the meeting uh, over uh, to you and then I'll open it up if uh, council wants to have any conversations. So uh, Rose, uh, the meeting is yours. Well, thank you and thank you to the council as well for letting us be part of the meeting tonight. I appreciate that. I will first of all introduce you to the 2020 ambassadors. Our ambassador, Beth Mattioli. Hey Beth. And Beth, did you want to say a few words and speak to council? Sure. Well, thank you guys for having us tonight. I think it's great that we're able to do this for the candidates, even with COVID in these times. Uh, thank you guys for having us. It's been a fun year so far and can't see where I want to. I'm excited to see uh, where the candidates go and the, where the rest of the year takes us. So, thank you. Thank you, Beth. I appreciate that. Um, the next ambassador that I would like to introduce you to is 2020 Ambassador Sarah Fudit. Hi. Hey, Sarah. And likewise, would you like to say a few words? Um, I can. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd also like to thank you guys for uh, ha having us on here, even though we can't do it in person, it's still nice to be able to formally recognize that the candidates are the candidates. Um, pretty special. So yeah, I also can't wait to see where the candidates go and how much they grow this year. So thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Our next ambassador for 2020 is Jadacia Barker. 
Hi, Jadesha. I think you're still muted. Yeah. There, you can't go. Through, you can't go through a Zoom meeting without somebody at some point saying, "I think you're muted." So, uh, yeah. kudos to you. You did it for us. So, go ahead. Thank you for having us. And I know we have a great group of candidates this year, and I can't wait to see how they grow and the program changes them. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. So on behalf of council, before we get into the candidates, on behalf of council, I want to thank the three of you for taking on the role of ambassadors in probably one of the most challenging situations that we've had to face as a society and, and for the program as well. Uh, I didn't certainly get an opportunity to interact with you as I normally do with the ambassadors because we end up at the same kinds of public events. Uh, but I know uh, that through Rose and the program, your time was filled and you did get opportunities to engage and interact in the community. So thank you for those efforts. Uh, and we appreciate uh, fully uh, what the program does for you as individuals and what it does uh, for our community. And I see a hand from Councillor Runch. <clears throat> Yeah, you know, because so I can at least say something sometime. Hey, uh, Sarah, Beth, and Jadesia, thank you so much for uh, for everything you did, you know, because this was tough. These were tough times. And, you know, I saw you guys in the school doing this uh, and keeping this program alive. And, uh, you know, it's you know, it's really positive to see that, you, you know, how many new uh, candidates you brought forward, you know, given, you know, the limited uh, chances you had actually to interact with all these people. So, you know, just you know, my hat off to you. If I, you know, that's the only thing I can hey, thank you so much for uh, doing what you guys did this year. Thank you, Councilor Ryan. Okay, Rose, why don't you take us through the candidates for this year? Thank you. I also would like to say this has been a very challenging year. Having candidates, having seven candidates this year does show that our ambassadors have really strong in a very good way stood up for the qualities of the program. The program really focuses a lot on building resilience. And what I continue to say over and over again is we are having a lot of opportunities to practice resilience this year. Very much so. Yeah. So we have seven lovely candidates that I would like to introduce. The first of which is Olivia Vanden Elden. And her sponsor this year is William Lacey Real Estate. Hi, Olivia. Now, Olivia, you're the first of the candidates. And so my regular speech to the candidates, uh, generally when we're in public, uh, is that this is your first opportunity to present yourself as all of the candidates are uh, in a public way. I see that uh, you're wearing uh, the sash and have already been pinned. So that takes the nervousness out of my job. Uh, because as Councillor Rudenberg will attest, I get pretty antsy and nervous about that aspect of, of my job. Uh, but it is for, for you as the first to go, Olivia, uh, but for all of the other candidates, an opportunity to introduce yourself and your aspirations for the program. So the floor is yours. Thank you guys for having me here. Um, Yeah. I'm You're, sorry. <laughs> that's okay. Feel free to just say a few words. Oh, I'm just, I'm hoping this program will help me better myself in being able to speak publicly and confidently. Great. Thank you. And thank you uh, for taking the program on. I think it, uh, it's a really good challenge. Well done. Thank you. Our next candidate is Brianne McCarthy, and her sponsor is Wendy Cortez from Advanced Skin and Laser. Uh, hi, my name is Brianne McCarthy, as Rose said. I joined this program because I actually had heard some, because um, one of my brother's friend's uh, girlfriend had taken it, and she had talked to me. Also, Beth was really helpful in explaining what it was going to be like and how to do it. I don't really have issues with public speaking, but that's just because my grandparents grew up here. My parents grew up here. I've gotten quite used to talking to people in public, but it, I, 
my aspirations with this course is hopefully to just learn more about our town and working with more volunteering, which I heard this course is really good for, and just learning more about this town's history. And yeah. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Brianna. We have done a little bit of volunteering this year, but definitely not as much as we did. <clears throat> and the candidates haven't had an opportunity to volunteer in the community yet, but we really hope things open up that way. Mm -hmm. Our next candidate is Janea Dume and Pam Devereaux from Century 21 is her sponsor. Hi. Would you guys like to say, what would you like me to say a few words or? Absolutely, Janaya, please. Okay, I just really want to confidently learn to speak and also learn to put like good outfits together because that's just good to know. <laughs> and just the gaming experiences in like our society. And it was also like a really well-recommended program to join so I was really curious about it excellent and, and if you learn to put good outfits together my wife will tell you I need some help on that front me too yeah so we can work together on that <laughs> yeah so a few of the workshops that they've already completed is the Superhost program, which talks about the importance of a first impression. And so that's what she's talking about, about how we need to create uh, an outfit that demands attention and respect at the same time. And the other course that they have completed is the Dress for Success program, which promotes the same things. Dressing well makes people feel like you belong where you are. And I know one of the main um, phrases that we talk about is fake it until you become it. And so they are learning the importance of that as well. Excellent. Our next candidate is Maylene Renge and her sponsor is the Rotary Club of Cornell. Hello everyone. Thank you for having me. Um, it's an honor being here, it's an honor being a candidate. I just want to say that I am re really looking forward to this program. I'm really looking forward to all the self-development workshops we're gonna be able to do, the leadership skills we're gonna build, and hopefully some volunteering uh, opportunities that we might be able to do. Um, I'm just so excited for everything that's gonna happen in the next few months. Terrific. Thank you, Naylene. Thank you. Thank you, Naylene. Our next candidate is Jesse Johal. And this year she is being sponsored by sponsored by West Quinell Business Association. Hi. Um, I joined this program because I thought it was very interesting and I wanted to work on my public speaking skills. And I also wanted to learn more about Cornell. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Jesse. Thank you, Jesse. Another little thing I'd like to add is because we are in times where we're not allowed to travel to other communities, we've actually been having some communication via Zoom with the other places in, in BC that provide the ambassador program. And our candidates haven't had the opportunity yet, but our ambassadors have actually virtually attended lots of activities in other cities with other ambassadors. So that's been a good experience for them to meet young people in other communities without traveling. And, and Rose, if I could offer, because there's often an interaction with the city, civic government, et cetera. Uh, I've been doing some of that with some of our youth groups that normally I would go and attend. And we'll be happy to do that as part of your program where we can arrange and just book some time and, and have your ambassadors and candidates on and we can just have a dialogue about local government or civic government as well. So, so that's available too. We would appreciate that. I know Mr. Runge did um, a Zoom with us last year and it was, it was an excellent opportunity to speak with someone in a political way about things that are concerning young people. So that was appreciated. Awesome. 
All right, our next candidate is Jasmine Sterling, and her sponsor is Green River Gold Corporation. Hi. Um, I'd like to say I am I am really grateful for the opportunity and um yeah uh, the first time I heard about this program I felt that it was an amazing opportunity and that I could not miss and I joined this program to better myself as an individual and to achieve new goals such as public speaking and uh, etc Terrific. Thank you, Jasmine. Good luck in the program. Yeah. Thanks, Jasmine. Claire Lejeune, I'm not sure how to pronounce her last name. I have to honestly tell you, I only met all of everyone today for the first time myself when we did the sash ceremony because we have just been meeting virtually. So forgive me if I've spelled, pronounced her name wrong, and I probably have. Claire's Sponsor is Attitude South. Hi, um, it's Lanes. It's Latvian. I get it. It's really hard to pronounce. Um, I'm really hoping to gain a lot more confidence in myself, like through this program. And I, like a lot of other girls, I've been really looking forward to the volunteer work. I'm, yeah. Terrific. Thank you, Claire. Thank you. And, and again, Rose, I think not only is it a testament to the community and to your program that we've got this number of Thank candidates uh, forward, uh, but the continuation of the sponsorship uh, in the community and the importance of the sponsors and picking up the candidates and giving them the support in the program, I think needs to be recognized as well. And to your volunteer uh, base uh, that make the program uh, a success too. And as the public ought to know, council provides year over year financial support to this program as a testament to how we feel it's important in the community and, and ought to be supported as well with our local uh, tax base. So uh, any parting comments, uh, Rose, or any of the ambassadors? I'd really just like to, again, thank the city for sponsoring. I think the longer I stay in this program, the more important I realize the program it is. I also see that the young people really want to be volunteers in the community. That's actually one of their main goals is to be part of the volunteer community. And I know that once we start people on the volunteering path, they usually live a lifetime of volunteerism. So for me, that's actually a huge advantage to running the program. And I know the city sees that. So thank you. And thanks again for letting us join you tonight. And my candidates and my ambassadors will be signing off at the end of this presentation. Okay. And I, I see Sarah, I think you've got your hand up to say a few words. I do. Um, I actually just wanted to give a quick thank you to the city council for the jackets. We never got to thank you for that properly, I don't think, and we'll really enjoy them. So thank you. Awesome. That's great. Yeah, we, we're quite pleased to have a branded jacket that you can wear as you go out and about. So I'm glad that you've enjoyed them. That's awesome. Good. Well, thank you all. Uh, we really appreciate you being here and let's hope uh, that on this uh, COVID continuum uh, that we're on, uh, that we do get back to some kind of normalcy this year and, uh, and that the candidates who become uh, the 2021 ambassadors get an opportunity to engage in the community along the, you know, the lines that previous ambassadors had. So uh, we'll see you all soon somewhere um, either in the ether or in reality. So thanks very much. Bye all. Bye, thank you. Okay, council, uh, we can continue with our business as people uh, book off. Uh, so moving into our uh, regular agenda, uh, we have some unfinished business, a city manager will report and give us an update on where we're at with the BC Winter Games. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So, Councillor Goulet, 
uh, will recuse himself for this portion. So, uh, Miss Hartley, if you wish um, to uh, just text Councillor Goulet uh, to allow him to come back in again. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So uh, this is just a follow-up item, as you mentioned. Uh, I think that the news is certainly out in the community already that we have submitted a qualifying bid for the BC Winter Games. Just a bit of uh, the backstory here is after we missed the first deadline, we reported it up to council. And the key issue at that point in time is that we were missing one required endorsement for our application. Um, after that report to council, city staff did meet with BC Game staff, explained our issue and explained that the group felt that it was just strictly a timing problem that if they had more time that they'd be able to work through and come to a resolution on that endorsement. So BC Games gave us an extra one month period of time ending on March 15th to get all the endorsements required in place. And subsequently we did receive all those required endorsements. So I'm happy to announce that we did put out a qualifying bid. The, um, the timing for the announcement actually of who is successful receiving the games, I've been told today is probably the fall of this year, but, but maybe earlier, it's just dependent on how many communities and, and whatnot. So, I, I think uh, we just keep our fingers crossed and so it's till such time. And I, um, I think it's appropriate to thank everybody who worked so hard to make just the application, a qualifying application. It was a long process uh, done through our economic development department, but with a lot of input from various community groups and a lot of good faith shown along the way. So I think it's a good start to what we're gonna need to do to make this game successful. And we will, uh, of course, keep you up to date if we hear any more, as soon as we hear an announcement. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Any questions from Council, Council Runge? Uh, thank you, uh, Byron. I, I really do wanna echo your, uh, and thank you for making this happen because it's it's really, a, you know, I'm re I was really happy to hear this. So thank you very much. And really thank you the whole team at, the, at City and all, all the community members that you know came together to put this on. Great. Seeing no other comments, that's an information item only. Uh, if we could get Councillor Goulet back on. Great. So Councilor Goulet has uh, joined us. Uh, and just for clarification, because it's not always self-evident to the public, uh, Councilor Goulet has another role and that is as the chair of uh, the school district. And so that's why he took himself out of uh, this discussion. Uh, so uh, next up uh, is the committee reports and the financial sustainability not a committee, uh, Councilor Elliott. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So this is just a quick report out from the FSAC meeting on March 8th and some of the uh, topics that we discussed. Uh, something you're going to be seeing in, in, uh, in the next while for sure, and especially with the out years, there's lots of work to be, do, uh, to be done with the landfill and the liability. So the committee reviewed the landfill liability and capital report and requested that the whole report go to the future council meeting so we can all be on the same page. Um, there are some challenges now, but mainly it's financial in, in the future, and, and we're playing nice by trying to, uh, trying to get that all organized um, well in advance, so we're covered off. Um, we discussed outhouses. Um, as, previous, as discussed previously, there's a need for either updates to outhouses in the city or new locations for some of them. Uh, this will be a much needed addition to the city infrastructure and will be very uh, convenient for those choosing to be outside using our parks and trails. Is, and that's exactly what we're trying to do is get people outside. And uh, we'll see the recommendation below. Uh, the North Fraser Drive Landing. As Council is aware, there are some wonderful new initiatives taking place at the North Fraser Drive Landing. A report was brought to FSAC from Director Turner. It outlined the possibility to leverage resources if done at the same time as the Caribou Field Plan. It's important to determine how the bench ought to be developed 
with required uh, flood proofing since it is in the 200 year flood plan. Uh, and we'll see the recommendation below as well. Uh, virtual audit due to COVID-19. This is the first time that the finance department is going through an audit that is virtual. And happily, uh, there, are no, there don't appear to be any challenges at this point. Uh, correspondence. We had a request from uh, Big Brothers Big Sisters. Uh, FSAC received a request for financial assistance from Big Brothers Big Sisters Quinnell in relation to a COVID, the uh, COVID-19 relief grant. The re committee respects all the work this group and every other nonprofit group does in this community. At this point, the committee would have a hard time moving forward with this as there are so many groups that could use the help and it would be very difficult to give financial aid to all of them. So this is a tricky one. Uh, as mentioned, you know, well-respected, lots of work, but when it comes right down to the end of it, who do you, uh, who do you end up giving money to, or do we just, uh, uh, you know, stay away from this at this point in time and focus it in another direction. So that was the recommendation from, from FSAC. Uh, the bulk water rates, more correspondence, a request was received to reduce bulk water rates. At this point, there will be no change in rates. The city goes through the process of updating rates each fall and input is welcome at that time of year. So we'll be taking a look at that uh, in the fall as well. Uh, high savings interest account. The director of corporate and financial services let the committee know that staff is looking at opening a high savings interest account with the municipal finance authority in order to receive better returns on our funds. Uh, up the Quinnell Business Association updates. Staff received a request from one BIA in Quinnell asking for updates when a new business opens in their specific area. Uh, it is felt that this would take a significant amount of staff time to potentially let each BIA know when a business is opening, closing, or relocating. It was felt that the BIA should be aware of new businesses in their areas and a quick drive in the area would, uh, could save significant uh, staff time. So the city will continue to provide businesses, business license listings when requested. So the recommendations for the proposed locations of the new house, uh, outhouses, move Mayor Simpson and seconding Councillor Elliott and resolved that the Financial St Sustainability and Audit Committee recommends to Council that outdoor washrooms be installed at the following locations. South Quinnell Park, Sugarloaf Dog Park, that's a replacement, Brinkman Brinkman Gardens, that's also a replacement, and the Lewis Drive Community Garden Area. And that was carried unanimously, and I would move that recommendation. Once a meeting, we have to remind people when they're muted, Mr. Mayor, to you. <laughs> Thank you for that, Councillor Elliott. <laughs> uh, this is our formal meeting, so I had to, I, you know, I got it out of the way for everybody else. Um, so just as a reminder, this is a budgeted item. So the budget's already approved. We're using COVID grant money for that. And correct me if I'm wrong, Council Elliot, but Elliot, but I recommend, I recollect that uh, we're leaving one uh, um, still available uh, because we, there was a couple of other options for placing, yeah. but we've got one potential public washroom uh, that we can build somewhere else once we get a sense of how these ones work is that yeah that's exactly right this way we'll be able to look at maintenance uh, how much it takes uh, to take care of them how they're working and then we can look at uh, potentially putting them in one or more sites if we so desire down the yeah. road and the other aspect of that of course is one of the sites we were looking at is steel tingley park because we closed the washrooms across from the park but we're waiting to hear from the canada infrastructure grants as to whether or not you know, phase one of Lateco Cultural Center will go ahead, which has a public washroom in that project. So, so we've got one on hold, and then these are the recommendations for the ones that we, we would deploy given the budget that we've got. Any questions or comments on locations? Councillor Runge. Thank you. I just have a question. Should one of these locations possibly not work out due to all sorts of issues that were discussed, I think, during FSAC, you know, security type issues. How easy is it to move these to a different location or is it? No, these are permanent structures. So I, I guess we don't have Matt on, but these are more of the highway-esque ones, like you would see at McLeese Lake, 
so they would have to be deconstructed would be my guess, city manager. Thank you. My understanding is that they're a little bit more modular than that. They would need to be deconstructed, but they could be deconstructed if necessary. But of course, uh, when you're installing these, there is, you know, infrastructure in the ground. So it's a, it's a bit, it would be a bit of a job to, uh, to move these. So we do want to get the location right to start with. And, and Councilor, so then, I'm, so sorry. Then my, I'm sorry, Councillor Ronch, go ahead. Sorry, Councillor, Councillor Elliott. Um, then my second question is uh, in, in the discussions, I was trying to, I was parsing through the uh, FSAC minutes and I didn't see any of that. Uh, did we have any estimate on uh, the cleaning costs to these also? Because that's, or is that, or we'll see that how, how they go. Like, I, I'm just, I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm worried if it's, uh, you know, in some of the areas, if it, if it takes cleaning twice or three times a day, then I'm, I'm just worried about. So Councilor Runge, again, I want to remind uh, from a process perspective, <laughs> The decision to build these has already been made and the time for conversations about operational budgets and all that should have been in the decision. This no. is a placement decision, but you know, FSAC can get some update from the city manager and others once we know what, what the actual costs are, but it was incorporated into our operating budget that we were going to add public washrooms. And I don't think anybody can give you a, a you know, a straight answer. We no, already no. have garbage pickup crews, et cetera. So uh, city manager. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And it should be as well be noted that two of these are replacements. Yeah. So half of them, there'll be no increase of cost at all because they are just a straight replacement, so. And uh, if I could, Councillor Runch, thanks for the questions. Uh, as far as security and things like this, the reason why these locations were chosen is they may not be as potentially risky as some of the other locations that uh, we were kind of looking at. So this is kind of why we're starting here. We'll figure out the costs, uh, figure out the security, things like this, and then potentially look at, at other locations as well. Okay. Thank you. Again, again, this is just a location discussion. All of the other discussions about actually doing this have been had already. So on the location, any further conversations about you know, potential locations or the locations being recommended. Okay, seeing none, all those in favor? Mayor, sorry. Sorry. With, with it on mute, I know we had two people say they would second, but I didn't get a seconder. That's okay, it was Councillor Goulet that seconded. Thank you. Okay, uh, Councillor Rudenberg, were you just on the vote? Okay, um, okay, so I see no opposition, uh, so that motion has passed. Councillor Elliott, the second motion. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And this is about the neighborhood plan. Moved uh, Mayor Simpson and seconded myself that the Financial Sustainability and Audit Committee recommends to Council to approve the expenditure of $20,000 for a revitalization plan for the North Fraser Drive landing from Council initiatives. That was carried unanimously and I would move that recommendation. Sorry, Mr. Mayor. Seconder for that motion, Councilor Goulet. Now, just for clarification, because uh, um, FSAC was given a bench, like a, a map of, of this area. And so it's effectively the Elliott Street area, North Fraser Drive area. And we've suggested the planning area be extended down through to where the viewing platform is on the Riverfront Trail. So it brings in that tow of houses that are down along the Riverfront Trail that that would be the planning uh, area for this neighborhood plan. I saw, I believe, Councillor Paul, did you have your hand up? I did. <clears throat> I did, thank you very much. So I'm presuming that this will be uh, consulting fees? Correct, so what the reason it's coming this way, Councillor Paul, is that we've approved a neighborhood plan uh, for doing the caribou field as per the work we were doing with UNBC, et cetera, and taking a look at all of that. When the development came forward uh, for the area around the Native Friendship Center, council had a discussion that it really begs the question of doing a neighborhood plan for that area as well, especially with Elliott Street there and some of the property cleanups we're doing. So you're right, this would be additional consult consulting fees, uh, but it would be attempting uh, to get, put the two development plans out or neighborhood plans out at the same time to try and get e economies of scale. Does that answer your question? Thank you very much, yes. 
Any other questions about this? Seeing none on the motion, anyone opposed? Seeing no opposition, that motion has passed unanimously. Now on the report itself, questions or comments? Councillor uh, uh, Rudenberg, I, uh, hang on a second because I wanna track the uh, hands. So I saw Councillor Rudenberg, Councillor Vic, Councillor Runge and Councillor Paul, okay? Hey, okay, Councillor Rudenberg, go ahead. Thank you. Um, it's just a question on the um, the one uh, piece here on the high savings interest account with uh, MFA. So is that basically an investment account that we're putting our money into? It's not a bank account, right? No, it's, and Director Bolton isn't here, so I'll ask the city manager. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So yes, that is a, it's still through the MFA. So it's one of their accounts. We can still access our funds overnight if they need to be. So it's still highly liquid, but it is a slightly higher interest rate. And we say high interest rate, but in today's world, that means still under 1%. So, but okay. doing the best we can to make money off the treasury function, right? So. No, I appreciate that we're using MFA for that. So thank you. Yeah. And I think for clarity, because it's one of the areas that the public may not be aware of that need to be liquid. Uh, is a requirement for us. We're quite constrained on the kinds of longer term, higher return investments that we can engage in. Uh, so this is partly a cash management issue to try and just maximize the return on, on available cash while remaining liquid. So, uh, Councillor Vick. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And uh, I wanna thank uh, Councillor Elliott for a thorough report as always, there's tons of information there. And I know you guys have a tough job with, with the litany of uh, requests and whatnot. So my, um, my comments tonight are pertaining to the Big Brothers, uh, the correspondence regarding Big Brothers, Big Sisters. And I, I have some uh, other information I sort of like to bring to the table. And I'm wondering, um, I think the best way to do that would be for me to put a motion on the floor, Mr. Mayor, if, if, that, uh, if that works, and then have a discussion based on that motion. So, get, so Councillor Vic, because we're dealing with the report, you can feel free to just um, engage in the conversation because if the motion gets defeated by no one seconding the motion, then you don't get to have the conversation. And the item is a report item. So you're free to open a dialogue with respect to the report. So it's really your call. Oh. If you want to put a motion forward, you're free to do so. I feel like a gambling man tonight. Okay. So here's my motion um, that council support Big Brothers Big Sisters Quinnell with a one time contribution of $10,000 with funding coming from the COVID safe restart grant. That's my motion. Seconder for the motion. Councillor Paul. I'll second it for discussion only. So the motion then is on the floor. And so now we are constrained to a discussion of the motion for the support. So just so everybody's clear, uh, that's what we're doing. Okay, go Very ahead, nice. Vic, lead us off. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So, and I do appreciate the, the complex nature of the request and in its context with how we support other groups. So the information I'd like to bring forward is some facts or some, some correspondence that I've had with the group that I think put it in a unique position and in unique and not in a great way. Um, unique in that, first of all, this group's budget um, has a heavy reliance on fundraising. And I'm not saying other nonprofits have a similar reliance, but this group has a particularly high reliance on fundraising and to the tune of about $50,000 a year. Um, which helps them deliver their core, for, core programming. Um, so the, a second uh, uh, piece of information that is, is per perhaps not widely known is this group uh, employs staff to deliver their programming, which of course puts, uh, puts some strain on the budget uh, without, this, without the staff requirement or with the staff, they are able to deliver their programming, which of course, uh, big brothers and big sisters uh, uh, supports 25 kids, some at risk, some that are vulnerable, and they also support 30 kids in the community through a school mentoring program. So they, uh, this group relies on that fundraising in part to deliver this very important program. Um, 
So by virtue of these, these unique issues, um, I really believe that uh, council should support this group. Um, the, the COVID situation has unduly affected their fundraising. Uh, and there is a potential that this group may not function and cannot function uh, next fiscal because of the reliance they have on fundraising. Uh, yes, they draw on uh, uh, funding from gaming, but like many nonprofits do, which there is some question if gaming will be whole next year. So that's a whole other issue. Um, but this group definitely relies heavily on fundraising examples. I know, I know council knows some of their fundraising activities, such as the Bullathon for kids, the golfing for kids. They also have a volunteer program with uh, recycling of clothing. I'm happy to see that they were successful last weekend with a clothing drive, but that is a one time. Normally this is done all year round. Um, in my motion, I made reference to an actual dollar amount, which I know FSAC did not benefit from that when they were considering this request. Um, in looking at their budget, the most vulnerable item in that budget where they must have funding is their rent for their space that they occupy from which they deliver some of their services. Um, should, we, should we choose to contribute, that money would go directly to paying for their occupancy costs and take that stress off the table for them. So I, uh, I, I hope this extra information is helpful and uh, I look forward to uh, having a conversation. Questions or comments on the motion? Councillor Paul and then Councillor Elliott. So uh, Councillor Runge, just so we're clear, and Councillor Paul, I still have you on my speakers list for the report. Uh, so I'll come back to that uh, after we discuss this motion. Uh, so Councillor Paul on the motion just now, and then I have Councillor Elliott. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, I'm not muted, okay. Um, I'd just like to ask Councillor Vic if, if, if he would consider possibly 5,000 instead of 10,000 at this point. Of course. This group is this group is very desperate. Any amount would help them. Okay, so okay. I think let's stick, uh, Councilor Paul, if we could, let's stick with the principle of whether it's appropriate for council to make a contribution to a single not-for-profit, and then we can come back and deal with the number, if if you will. Go ahead, okay, Good. yeah, and thank you for that because what I what I wanted to speak to was. Um, I'd like FSAC and, and council ultimately uh, to look at what they're doing in Williams Lake with their COVID money. In Williams Lake, uh, they have um, put up $25,000 made up of 10 $2,500 uh, grants to service clubs, um, community groups, uh, nonprofit organizations that are really on tough times as a result of uh, of covid and i i'd like to and that's why i was suggesting that i wouldn't want to see us spend all of our money on on big brothers uh given the fact that there are many other groups and and organizations out there that that really are deserving of some help at this time and so, that's why i was asking if yeah. if if the number could be uh brought down a little bit yeah, and we can, as I said, we can come back and parse the number. You turned your video off, Councillor Paul, instead of... Oh, I'm sorry. And I need to see your handsome face there so I can watch the body language and all that fun stuff, right? So, um, so, so for clarity for the ongoing discussion we have here, uh, because your point is well taken, this is COVID money. So Council's budget policy with our tax revenue that we collect Council has taken the position that we will not be the entity of last resort for not-for-profits who are struggling, struggling in our community. And so we have a budget policy that we do not provide direct sponsorship or support uh, to not-for-profits in our community, except in strategic circumstances, uh, like uh, a relationship we have 
uh, with the ambassador program or like a relationship uh, we have, uh, you know, that's emerging uh, with the seniors uh, council. So that's from taxpayer perspective. From the COVID relief money, I think we need to again all be reminded we are assisting in our community on vulnerable populations. Council had an opportunity to talk about the disposition of $100,000 in our community and chose not to get into the weeds on, on that at this time, but just earmarked $100,000 for vulnerable populations and contributed $100,000 to the seniors council. So I find the comparison of $2,500 you know, out, uh, you know, in 25,000 overall in Williams Lake is just how they're devolving their program. We actually have quite a bit of ear money, uh, uh, money earmarked for vulnerable populations that are, have yet to be allocated. So the question here is an allocation process question, right? Uh, where Big Brothers Big Sisters has approached us because they have a connection to what we're doing with the seniors council who have then come and said we're in need and council's question is exactly as councillor paul's put it if this is an association that we're going to fund then it begs the question of all the others so it's a process question more than a actual dollar question at this point i would suggest councillor elliott yeah thank you mr mayor and you, you covered off you covered off what I'm thinking as well. I mean, this is this is this is uncomfortable. This is tough for everybody. There's no question about it. But if this is the direction that that we want council to be going, then then we've got to look at every nonprofit in the city. I don't think that it's fair, although they do a wonderful job and I support them wholeheartedly whenever I can as as far as the fundraising efforts go. But how do we single out one group? So, you know, where do you want to start? And 10 in Williams Lake, that's not going to cover it here. There are a lot of groups that are struggling and I'm not sure that this is, this is the direction that we want to go because it's going to parse that money down so low if we give a chunk to every nonprofit in the, in the community. So although it's, it's difficult, I, I think that we should be going in our strategic direction. I mean, we did give 100,000 to the seniors uh, committee, but that's, you know, that's in our strategic plan as well uh, in moving forward with, with helping uh, all the seniors. Moving forward with the vulnerable population, I think it is important as well. But um, for me, the challenge is, is singling out one organization. Thank you. Councillor Runge. Thank you. Uh, you know, I, I speak actually in, the, the, in favor of us possibly looking at the uh, COVID relief money that we have left and creating some sort of a policy that we can actually maybe have a bit, you know, maybe this is an option, uh, an opportunity for us to get those groups that we have, have missed in our discussions previously. And, and so maybe there's a way for us to uh, quickly get to something like this. So, so because I don't think big brothers and big sisters are the only ones I am, I absolutely agree with Councillor uh, uh, Vic that this is, you know, this is something we didn't even think about, uh, you know, but we do, it, 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 there's a lot of kids that actually benefit from this. And, you know, I think it's incumbent on us also to support some of our youth here. Uh, I just, I'm just not sure if it's a process question, how do we get to that process to start allocating those excess funds that we have and, and using them? That's what the COVID money was for, to help vulnerable people we can have a check off box and then solve our problem this way my question to councillor vic is how long can they hold you know without any kind of money and then just a comment to you is just ha have them also talk to us because we can also help them with some things yeah, from a business perspective thank you go ahead i mean i think we have to be careful about putting councillor vic in the position of speaking for a third party organization so I think if we stick to the process question of, you know, if council wants to go down this path, what's the process, then we can go back and do that work. City manager. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So I just want to caution council a little bit. Uh, these previous council to this did the very, very difficult work 
of trying to wean agencies and different organizations in the community off the handouts from council. Council used to have a grant and aid program where we would fund various groups for various things and they're all good groups, all doing good things. But the question really was, was that a core mandate of the city to make sure all those groups did that? So, and it was a lot of hard work. And as council will remember, it was a, you know, it took a couple of years to do that weaning off of from the public funding. So I would caution council about starting to re-engage in that process. Because as you know, once, once we're back into regular times, our budgets are always tight. We never have an easy budget year. And if we've got groups used to getting money from the city again, you're, you're going back down that, I think it's a bit of a trap. Um, the second point, and I guess it's just more of a reinforcement of what councillors have said tonight, is we really need to take a principled approach. And this council has been known for a principled approach. We don't make willy nilly decisions around dollars. We do principled approaches. So if this is the direction that council says they would like to go to, then I would recommend we take the time to develop that approach to ensure that every worthy group in the community would have that same fair access to whatever that pot of money council would set aside for it. So. Uh, two things. First, I personally, uh, and I'm not trying to say it's my decision because it's a council decision. I, I would really be hesitant about putting, throwing dollars out to community groups. But secondly, if you're going to take a principled approach, something that is defensible and you can then tie it to the overall amount that you would like to see paid out. And just, I believe the, these type of expenditures probably would work under that COVID grant. But as council will know, most of that grant at this point in time has been allocated through the budget process too, right? So this request is a bit, you know, funky with regards to that budget process, but there you have it. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have Councillor Goulet and then I have myself on the list, Councillor Goulet. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And just to, uh, uh, to, to follow up, I know this is, this is, a, this is a really hard, uh, 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 thing for us to to look at, but one thing maybe is sending this back to the finance committee for some to do some due diligence on if we're looking at a process, if we're, we're looking at something um, to make a, a recommendation back. Is that possible, or can we we just refer this back? I think there's a, a piece here too, um, and I'll use big brothers and sisters in general. Um, even without COVID, uh, other municipalities uh, have made ways to give them funding uh, for years, right? I don't know what their process is. I tried to find out how they did, but they do support, um, they take a, a few charities. It's done in Williams Lake and it's done in Williams Lake where uh, they've just taken and decided to uh, uh, acknowledge the big brothers and give them a, a, a grant throughout uh, the years, even without COVID. And I don't know what process or how they got to that point, but they did do that on an annual and ongoing basis. So there's some research I think that probably needs to be done uh, especially because I like what Big Brothers and Big Sisters does and what they do in the community and their approach. But on the other hand, I'm listening to everybody else about there's other nonprofits that do a lot of good work and are deserving as just as well. So we have to be careful here. We don't open something where we get a whole bunch of requests from nonprofits um, coming forward and then you have to make a decision each and every every time. Right. So uh, there's a there's a fine here, but I'm just wondering if there's a way we can we can. Uh, uh, put this back to the uh, FSAC for uh, a process or develop something that can come forward. So we, we can have a deferral motion if that's where we end up and defer it to FSAC uh, so we can address that from a process perspective. I see uh, uh, Councillor Rudenberg as a first time speaker and then Councillor Runge that I see your hand go up as a second time speaker. So I'm going to have Councillor Rudenberg weigh in. I'll make some comments and then I'll go to Councillor Runge on the second round. Councillor Rudenberg. Thank you. Unfortunately, I think what Councillor Goulet is talking about is exactly what uh, City Manager Johnson just said that we managed to wean ourselves away from is having those groups come back on a yearly basis. Um, you can correct me if I'm wrong, Manager Johnson, but I think that's what you were talking about. So, so for me, I totally agree with everything I've heard here, including from FSAC Chair, uh, Councillor Elliott. 
this is a really, really tough pull at your heart string kind of conversation that we're having because we know what kind of work this organization does in the community. And we recognize the fact that these guys are hurting for funding because the majority of their, <coughs> excuse me, the majority of their funding comes from fundraising. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> um, I, given the fact we have a motion on the floor, but I think past this motion, um, depending on where it goes, how is there a way that we can connect them into that whole vulnerable population discussion? Because when we talk about, you know, they work with at-risk youth and uh, vulnerable kids, how do we steer that into that whole vulnerable population category that we've used for some of our funding? And the other piece is, you know, how do we provide them additional support from our business hotline and all those programs that are out there, you know, whether it comes to the rent relief or staff funding, et cetera. Not, I, I don't know where all that um, grant stuff has, what has happened to it, because it's changed a little bit, but I think there's some additional support that we can give them after this discussion. Okay. Thank you. So I have myself and then I'll go to a second round, uh, Council Run. So it, just a couple of things, uh, and Council Rudenberg spoke to it. So to Council Goulet's point about maybe we should do some research, uh, we don't need to. This council and this city was on that path. Uh, so much so that, you know, people who were on council when the Cornell Community Foundation was established, that was supposed to end the grant and aid program uh, here, uh, because uh, you know, how does a council be an arbiter of which not-for-profits, which organizations get funding or don't get funding? What was the process? So the grant and aid program was heavily suspect uh, because it really depended on who had a passion for what. And I don't mean any disrespect, Councillor Vic, but tonight's illustrative of the problem with that kind of process where one group gets a counselor to be an advocate in council chambers. Well, what about all the other groups that don't have a counselor advocating? Or if that's the process, then every counselor becomes susceptible to every group advocating for their group to come forward for taxpayer funding or for found money. It's just bad process. Uh, we can't, you know, the, the argument that big brothers, big sisters, and again, with all others, I respect very much so the work they do, that because they're different because they have staff and because they have structured programs, well, so does the Child Development Center, uh, which depends in large part on, on um, uh, uh, some of the programs, the truck, touch a truck and various other uh, fundraising activities that they do that they couldn't do. Amata Transition House, uh, the Women's Resource Center, there's a host of organizations in our community. And then it didn't stop there when we had grant and aid and, and pre-foundation because all of the different sports groups would come forward and they're just as vital in our community from our community resiliency, supporting youth, et cetera. You know, so does the soccer comp, you know, uh, groups come forward, the baseball groups come forward. So that's why council made a concerted decision to, to council Goulet's point to walk away from a grant and aid program. And I can tell you uh, that the CRD and Williams Lake and Hanuma House all struggle with their grant and aid program and would like to walk away from it and would like to have something like we have with the foundation here. So, so I think there's a question begged in here as to what's the evolution that the Quinnell Community Foundation needs to make uh, in their programming because that's really what a lot of that money is there for. for can they have ongoing relationships with key organizations uh, here? Uh, because this discussion is only about a grant that we got. It's not a discussion about ongoing taxation. That Council Vic was clear about that. It's a one-time shot and others have been clear. It's about COVID money on a one-time basis. So again, I wanna remind council that we have earmarked $100,000 for vulnerable population. The reason that's earmarked is because it was $10,000 for food security and council felt that wasn't enough, that we needed to be positioned to do more on the food security front and therefore we wanted to amp that up. Now food security program, if we can pull it off, would impact a very large part of our po population and it is currently a gap in service delivery that we're trying to fill. 
So there's a rationale and a logic behind us taking the COVID money, putting it out there, widely dispersed and meeting a gap in our community. But we've now been approached and, and others are aware of this, the clean team isn't funded. Well, again, that's a vulnerable population because if those needles and other paraphernalia aren't picked up, at least in the stopgap measure, then all of the backlash against the harm reduction strategy in our community is all going to amp up again, et cetera. And that's a highly vulnerable population. So council needs to be making a decision. Do we use some of that 100K with year mark to backstop clean team until such times as we can help secure them funding long-term? So the idea that somehow, you know, there's money floating around, that's not how council approached the COVID money. Uh, we actually earmarked it for things, and one of those things was 100K for vulnerable populations, which is tentatively marked for food security and tentatively marked for uh, street type uh, interventions and programs. If council wants to defer this motion to FSAC to look at $2,500 checks, uh, then you have the right to do that. But as the city manager and others have pointed out, where does that stop? How do we be the arbiters of who's got a need that's greater than somebody else's need that's greater than somebody else's need and which groups in the community are more important to the community than other groups? So, it, you know, we got out of this business for a very good reason. And to the city manager's point, I would suggest we get back into it with eyes wide open that it is highly problematic. And I certainly would not support the motion as it is of 10,000 to one group without due process determining what the needs are in our community across the board and an actual process to determine how we would use this COVID grant uh, to meet some of uh, those needs. Councillor Runge. Yes, thank you. Mine will be quite short because mine's really just for clarification. I was under the understanding that we had a, tiny, a little bit of COVID money left that wasn't allocated yet. And that's the one, that was the only money that I was speaking to, that very limited pot of money. And maybe this is a good use to open it up with a process that we create. Like it has to be, I absolutely agree with that process. And it's, and then, and the outcomes there, are, if we decide to go that way, that would be based totally on what that COVID relief fund says that we could spend the money on. That was, that was all. It was not actually to cut into any of that previously, previously decided money. Yeah, and I think Councillor Runge on that, th those gold posts are changing because we've, we've just gotten some more COVID relief around the airport uh, that has implications for how we allocated the 2.5. But there's also uh, newer programs coming forward almost on a regular basis from council that's providing, or from the provincial government that's providing direct support uh, into organizations uh, and communities. So, you know, I think you can take a look. I think it was 23,000 or something that we had left unallocated, but that's changing and pretty amorphous at this point. I think if the direction to FSAC is go and come up with some kind of program, then we can deal with the, what money is available uh, uh, if council approves a program of some kind. Yeah, I didn't want a program. For me, it was just going to be, if anything, a one-time thing. That's it. That's what I meant. That's what yeah. I meant. Sorry. Some kind of policy or some kind of way yeah. of betting and making a decision is what I meant. So thanks for that clarification. I have Councillor Vic and then Councillor Paul. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll be brief on my follow-up here. Um, just in response to this, to the city manager's uh, sort of uh, um, statement that this could be a trap, um, I just, I don't agree with that. Uh, this COVID money is one time in nature, uh, a one time use. Um, at no time has there been discussion for ongoing program for any groups uh, that we may interact with in our day to day lives. This is a, a group that's in an extenuating circumstance. There is per potentially some budget remaining in our safe COVID safe restart grant. And so this is a one of one time contribution to help a valuable uh, group in need. Now, regarding deciding who, who, who deserves what money, I agree. Um, there are probably other groups in our community that need help. Um, but this group came forward partially because of, uh, you know, um, I've, there's a relationship between this group and the North Caribou Seniors Council. But um, anecdotally, many groups, uh, Several groups in our community have just found ways to muddle through 
I'm not, and we should have a process. Maybe there are other nonprofits that are on the verge of not being uh, functional due to funding. And, and, and maybe we should have a process right now to, to, to assist those select groups. But in, in the terms of big brothers and big sisters, this group is vulnerable and they need help. So um, I, 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 it is not a over, uh, year over year support that's on the table, never was. This is a one-time offer of support. Um, that we're, that's a question here. And uh, regarding other groups requiring the support, you know what, if there's groups that are this in this situation, then perhaps we should have a program to give them a hand. So I believe Councillor Elliott, I saw your hand up and then Councillor Paul. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, as the city manager and the mayor have pointed out, I was on council when we were dealing with this kind of situation before and, and how to, to divvy out money. And it's not easy at all. I respect big brothers, big sisters for what they do, but there are a lot of nonprofits in this community. And I'm sure every one of them is going to say that they're having issues, just like every company is having issues right now. So if we want to go back, so to be clear, I'm, there's no way that I can support this motion as it's presented right now. If you want to send FSEC back to where we were before, and whether it be a one time, I'll guarantee you, though, if we start putting funds out, people are going to be asking next year, even if COVID is done with. But if we want, if you want to direct FSEC to go back and get a list of all the nonprofits and divvy out the remainder of the money to every group, then I think we can do that. But unfortunately, and I've mentioned before, I love the work that Big Brothers Big Sisters does. But I also appreciate the work that Amata Transitions House does and so many others, Child Support Center, Friendship Center, everybody. So if we want to go on this route, then I think we have to divvy up the money accordingly to every group there. So I'm not sure how that's going to impact anybody at the end of the day. But we've been here before. It's never easy. Unfortunately, just to a one off to one group, I just I can't support it. I'm, I apologize. Councillor Paul. Yes, thank you. Uh, the reason I put my hand up was um, when you were talking about establishing a program, I'm putting that in quotation marks, and you clarified that no, we're not, we're not really talking about yeah. not an ongoing year to year program. We're talking about how we're going to deal with um, the little bit of money that we have left in the COVID pot. And uh, I, I would really like to have a look at what Williams Lake does. Now, I will say that, that I've done some research and it doesn't take much to, to find out who or which groups the, um, the Williams Lake Council has uh, granted funding to. I will say that, um, that my direction would be somewhat different than their direction in that I would be looking at, at vulnerable groups such as Big Brothers, Big Sisters. And you know, there may be some, there may be maybe some idea of, of finding some help within our own indigenous relations budget, because um, I know, and I don't think it's any secret that, that a, a good part of the client base uh, for Big Brothers, Big Sisters is actually uh, indigenous people. So I-, I Holy I think... guacamole, Paul. Sorry, sorry, somebody's got their um, speaker on that they need to be very careful what they're saying. So am I out of line? Sorry, so there was a sidebar comment made, Councillor Paul, that, that I was correcting. Oh, okay. Right. Um, but I guess the point being is that if this motion is defeated, uh, then we're done. Um, no. and, so, um, yeah, if I could, Councillor Paul, for clarification, because you're muddying the waters a little bit, uh, whether or not we would choose to tap into our reconciliation allocation, which I think is nominally $5,000, that's taxpayer money. So that's a very different conversation than what we're talking about with a one-time grant from the provincial government and how we allocate that. I want to remind council again, I think we don't, we don't need to deal with what the cash value is because that's a moving target uh, just now. We need to uh, deal with the issue of how do we get to a process that we're comfortable with 
so we don't have an individual approach, an individual counselor, and end up turning a council meeting into a lobby process for one group. That's not good process. Councillor Rudenberg. Sorry, I should have jumped in with a point of order. Um, Councillor Paul, I think that you making that kind of a statement about the clientele of big brothers, big sisters is not appropriate. And um, I somehow you need to take that back because we do not know if that's the truth or not. So please be please be careful how you how you say who the clients are of Big Brothers Big Sisters. I think that was a very inappropriate comment. Sorry. I, I will take that back and I will apologize. Uh, but I but at the end of the day, I think that we need to investigate this whole thing about. Um, you know, how, how can we help uh, vulnerable populations uh, with a little bit of money that we have? Yeah, so that two separate things and Councillor Paul, you know, will take it as an apology for a misstatement. And I think Councillor Rudenberg is correct. It's a, a statement not warranted uh, by any factual information you're providing to Council about the client group uh, for Big Brothers Big Sisters. So, um, so to Council Goulet's point and some others, if Council desires that some form of process, and I misspoke when I used the term program, uh, I think we all understand what we're talking about, some kind of process to do a fair allocation of some of the COVID money to not-for-profit groups in our community who have been hurt uh, by this situation, uh, then I would suggest a motion of deferral of the single group motion to uh, FSAC uh, for a process discussion and report back to council as quickly as possible would be in order. Councillor Paul? So moved. Seconded, Councillor Runge. Okay, any other questions or comments? Councillor Vic as a mover. Okay, okay. Uh, I'll take the vote then, anyone opposed? Okay, thank you. I'm going to close this off, Councillor Rittmer. Point of order. There's still a resolution. Um, there's a motion on the I'm floor. Come back. Yeah. No, no. We've deferred that motion. So Sorry, mo I thought. Oh, the okay. I I apologize. Yeah, the funding of Big Brothers Big Sisters has been deferred to FSAC. Okay. To, to deal with the process for dealing with that. Okay, because the amount is what it's kind of skewed. If you're if you're deferring the motion with that amount, can that change in the conversation yeah. when it gets back to the the FSA? Yeah, it's just deferred for okay. a, a finance committee discussion. Uh, and All right, then that's what I want to. Thank yeah. you. That's what I want to clarify. Yeah, and we still have the report. I have two speakers on the finance report that I need to come back to. I, I just want to close though, and again with respect to all council members, it it's the the inherent nature when we get into a situation like this, where there's an advocacy for a particular group and council members have to make a decision, it's a tough decision, you know, and the community pitches fur again, uh, that group. And, and that's part of the reason why we need to have process. Uh, it used to be that council would have delegations come uh, and we had one uh, in my very, I think first or second meeting as mayor where a delegation came forward to council, didn't even ask for any money, uh, and a council member put a resolution on the table to give them 500 bucks. And when you've got a group in front of you and council's you know, now pinned as to whether or not you're going to support this group with cash in the moment, it becomes very uncomfortable. So I wanna state clearly for the public, not one council member on this council does not you know, really appreciate the work of Big Brothers Big Sisters, want to see Big Brothers Big Sisters be successful, and if at all possible, among our other not-for-profit groups, if we can find some way to support them, we will. Every council member I heard uh, on this discussion has taken uh, that position. So we'll see what we can do at finance, and uh, uh, Councillor Elliott will make sure that's top of the agenda so that we can get to it as quickly as possible as Chair of Finance. Okay, so we're now back to the council uh, finance uh, report and I have Councillor uh, Runge and Councillor Paul. 
Thank you. Uh, so after that crazy discussion, uh, anyway, I, I'd like to go back to the uh, Cornell BIA updates because I think there has to be a little bit of clarification put into why that request was made to council in the first place. I actually brought it up uh, to the BIAs with, with regards to, hey, can, can we uh, say hello to all the new, BI, uh, new businesses that are in a BIA? And yeah. uh, so then I guess an email went to, uh, to uh, Director Bolton. And I, I think it was a slight misunderstanding because really all they wanted to know was, was their list up to date? Because in some of the BIAs, uh, uh, I, I think it's false to say you can just drive around and see the businesses because uh, some of the BIAs actually don't have businesses on the main drag or, uh, and they sometimes are in buildings or they're a numbered company listed in uh, Vancouver or something like that. So I just wanted to clarify that and say that. Is. So I think uh, what, what the BIA has come to is uh, they, they love it if they can just get that update uh, once or twice a year and then they'll just adjust it to their numbers. So I just... You know, because I asked them for that originally to say, hey, can we say hello to the new businesses? That's where it came from originally. Thank yeah, you. And I, I, you know, I don't know if Councillor Elliott wants to weigh in, but I, I can certainly state my opinion on it. Go ahead, Councillor Elliott. As chair. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Ms. Mayor. I, I think I was perfectly clear. I, I think that, um, you know, we've got each one of the BAAs has staff there to be aware of what's going on, whether they're whether they're driving around or or not, I I think they're they should be aware of what's going on. Thanks for the clarity that uh, that it was you that uh, brought the the inquiry forward to begin with. But it comes right down to uh, on our end, um, they're given information uh, yearly, and we just don't want to put uh, tax staff anymore on this kind of situation. Yeah, and I, I would just add to that: uh, why should city staff be doing the work? Uh, that those business improvement areas are levying uh, their businesses for. And it's not about numbered companies because this is property uh, and it's, it's all based on property and real businesses in those property holdings. So if the area business area executive director isn't aware of what's going on in the business area, I think there's a substantial problem. Uh, and I don't think it should be punted to city staff uh, to keep them apprised of what's going on in their area. No, I, th I think that's exactly what I'm trying to say. The business license goes to the city. Sometimes the BIAs, in all BIAs, do not know where the, uh, if those businesses are home-based business coming in that aren't on the main drag. That's all I was trying to say. It's not, of course, of course, this is, and this was a perfect time with all the other things that, that were happening for us to clarify all these things and try to get a clean slate. That's really where it was coming from. Could you give so me an like, example of where a home-based business would, would be applying for a business license that an executive director and a BIA wouldn't know? Well, let's say I'm, I'm doing an online business somewhere where I'm, where I'm starting a business from my home and I get a business license to You're run. You're not in my... the BIA then? If, if I'm in the BIA area? Well, again, the BIA area are commercial properties with commercial enterprises. They're not residential. All right. Thank you. But th that's where, so that would have been my confusion that I added onto it. So my yeah. apologies for that. So as we see tonight, there's a designated physical area uh, that incorporates only commercial properties. It's only commercial properties that are levied and it's only real businesses in those commercial properties that are popping up or closing. So, you know, for South Cornell Business Association at $80,000 a year incremental taxation to ask us to be having our city staff inform them when businesses are opening or closing in their area is a bit much, quite frankly. Uh, they're paid to do a job. Uh, they're levied. Uh, uh, they're commercial enterprises to do that job. It should be self-evident if a new business is opening because it takes a long window for a new business uh, to open signs are up, you know, retail space is built, all sorts of things. If they don't know that, then that's what we struggled with at finance. Like, why should city staff be doing what they should be doing well since you brought up which bia or, or the bia that you're speaking about we do have some businesses that run us in uh on north uh, on the highway uh, north of town and they have warehouses in south Quinnell that they wouldn't have known that so there are some issues and that's 
that was all that where we were getting. Yeah, so at. The, because the request was transparent, Councillor Runge, the request came from the South Cornell Business Association. It's in it, it, like it's a transparent request. So FSAC's given that indication that business association needs to do their job. Okay, Councillor Paul. Yeah, thank you. I, I promise that my question uh, shouldn't take very much time. In fact, I, I think that uh, Director Bolton might have the answer to that question. And, and it has to do with the virtual audit. And I'm just wondering, because the audit is virtual and the, um, the accountants don't have to travel to Quinnell, can we expect a, a bit of a savings there? Unfortunately, Director Bolton isn't even with us virtually. No, just kidding. No, no, she's not a little bit. No, I know she's on a little. I'm taking some time off. Uh, city manager. That's a really great question, but I don't have a answer for that. I didn't think about that question. So I know they're still doing the same amount of work, but they, I guess they would save a bit of travel expenditures from Prince George down. I would say with it dealing with the firm from Prince George, the travel's not a very huge uh, component of the uh, audit costs at any rate. Yeah, and I think city manager to be fair because it's it's a fair question, but um, all of the work is the same, Councilor Paul. So uh, the, the virtual audit will still do all of the interviews that they uh, did before, uh, would still do all of the document tracing that they did before, et cetera. But I think it's a fair comment to the city manager of, you know, the travel time. And actually, as I think about it, even our staff handling more documents in order to provide them with the documentation. So we can we can check it out with yeah. Director Bolton. Thank Jim. you. Perhaps the, uh, the audit was a poor example. Where I was going with that was that we seem to be into a virtual world and, and um, you know, I'm thinking about consultants not having, having to come up from the lower mainland and so on. So I, I would anticipate that we should be able to enjoy some savings as a result of this yeah. new virtual way of doing things. Yeah, absolutely. And we're hoping and we should be able to track that with discrete sort of long term relationships we have. I think the audit's a good starting point relationships with uh, entities like urban systems that we have, you know, lots of projects with, etc. So I think city manager it would be good to talk to Director Bolton about whether or not we have an ability to, to, to track that because we've actually embedded that in our logic around the upgrades to the technology uh, in uh, council chambers. Go ahead, Thank Sam. you. Yes, I think that's a really great idea. I will talk to Director Bolton about tracking it. In addition, one related one is travel and conferences for training or other type of conferences where there's some substantial funding being saved last year and again this year, both by uh, staff and by council as well. I may point out that we would be happy to track that as well and, and bring a report back because I believe this new virtual world we're living in, a lot of these good things that we're doing of not wasting our time traveling to conferences should, should result in some improved uh, perf financial performance for the city and some positive things to report out to the public. Yeah, okay, thank you for that. Any other questions or comments on the Finance Committee report? So, uh, Councillor Elliott, I think your report may have just hit a record for committee uh, reports uh, for dialogue. So, and you thought you were going to get straight through it. So, no, uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, it's, it's good to be able to have hard discussions with each other and still see uh, smiling faces. Uh, that that's, uh, doesn't go unnoticed uh, because we do have hard work to do. Uh, so next uh, two uh, are updates from me as uh, first as the chair of the Public Safety and uh, Policing uh, Committee. We had a special uh, meeting specifically and explicitly uh, for our staff sergeant to give an overview uh, to the committee of their strategic plan uh, for uh, the next year, so 2021-2022. Um, uh, we had a good substantive discussion. The plan aligns. Uh, there's been some modifications to the plan, and I'm not going to speak to the content of the plan because it's going to come to council. Uh, so the staff sergeant will be able to present uh, the, the actual plan itself. We were just making sure from a, a committee perspective that it was aligned and there were no areas of misalignment. 
uh, with uh, where we would like to see the RCMP uh, focusing its attention. There were a couple of areas, though, that we thought, and the city manager is going to work with the staff sergeant, uh, that we could potentially provide some incremental resources to either accelerate or deepen uh, some of the areas that are in the strategic plan. Uh, one area, for example, is in the kind of community policing downtown core uh, domain. Uh, and we were asked a question about uh, some incremental funding that used to uh, exist to add some additional patrols in the downtown core and the city managers working with the staff sergeant uh, to look at that. We think it's actually inherent uh, in, in the budget and it's just a new staff sergeant getting used to how to uh, allocate those resources. And then the other area is some mentoring and supports uh, into one of the strategic initiatives, which is to support the new supervisors. We're now in that wave where we have, uh, and we've always been a detachment that gets new constables uh, out of depot, and we do a lot of training of constables, but we now have new-ish individuals moving into supervisory uh, roles. Uh, that also need an incremental uh, support in that supervisory role. And there's a possible opportunity for us uh, to provide some uh, resources uh, to help uh, there. And then alignment around our anti-racism strategy or sensitivity training, uh, the community uh, policing, public safety issues, et cetera. So I think council will be pleased uh, when they see the staff sergeant before us as a delegation going over the plan and the Public uh, Safety uh, Policing Committee saw no issues of alignment uh, with the plan. We were just playing with some refinements uh, and some, as I said, potential incremental resources. Any questions on my report from Public Safety or any additions from other council members who are a member of that uh, committee? Okay, seeing none, we can move on. Uh, you've got the Community Forest Meeting uh, update notes. Um, I, I was really pleased uh, with uh, the meeting. Uh, it went very well. So for council's edification, uh, the partnership agreement for the non-replaceable forest license is now fully signed uh, and in the hands uh, of the provincial government. And that alone is a major milestone uh, because that's the signatures of the chiefs of Letaco, Luscus, Nazco and Estela and myself on behalf of the city and their technical staff's uh, signatures for the technical team. So having those four local governments come together and agree on that initial partnership for the non-replaceable forest license is a major milestone. We also agreed on draft uh, values uh, and aspirations we have for the community forest. And in the main, uh, there was agreement that will be refined over time and it has to be hardened up a little bit for the application. Uh, but in the main, we are all in agreement that first and foremost, we want to see a robust landscape level planning and robust ecological management of the land base that's assigned to the community forest. Uh, with a view to making sure those uh, ecosystems are resilient and, and are protected against large scale disturbances like fire and disease and so on. We all recognize that may be a more expensive form of land management, which means that a lot of the money that we get from the community force is going to be turned back into the land base. The second piece is incremental amenities on that land base that fit in with the land-based strategy. Trails, for example, viewscapes, uh, water, uh, uh, hydrology issues, et cetera. So really looking at through the lens of what incremental values and benefits can we get from that landscape that add to our strategic goals of tourism, livable community, uh, and so on, and in there, uh, would be First Nations archaeological interests and traditional use interests uh, as part of that as well. And then the final piece is agreement 
that money that's actually made from the community forest uh, would be used uh, to in, uh, achieve the strategic strategic objectives we have uh, for our community writ large. So again, a major milestone that that no one in that room saw the community forest as a potential cash cow. Uh, where at the end of the year we cut the check four ways or five ways and said thank you very much. Uh, that it's a collective enterprise that is going to be resourced heavily and it's going to be a full value to all of our, our communities. So that, that's ongoing. The next two steps we're looking for is the awarding of the non-replaceable forest license uh, to Lataco uh, and the beginning of getting some cash flow uh, from that. Uh, and just a heads up to council uh, that uh, Aaron and Lacey, uh, particularly Aaron, may be coming forward with an early request to provide some uh, interim funding uh, to get a, a, a person in place to, to continue uh, the work on the application process while the cash is realized uh, from the NERFL. So if there's a, a gap of three or four months, uh, we've already, as a council, indicated uh, that we would backstop that as long as we were fully uh, refunded uh, from the community force. So we may not need to do that, but it is a heads up that just depending on the timing of the awarding of the NERFL and activating it, there may be, uh, we may not want to see the progress uh, of this stymied. And then the other piece that we pushed the provincial government on is the invitation letter. Uh, because we're actually doing all of this work uh, without a formal invitation letter uh, to the five parties uh, that are involved in this. And we've got a commitment that we'll be seeing that invitation letter as soon as possible. Uh, we have a new minister, a minister that's got a lot on her file, including some pretty substantive changes to the Forest Act that are coming into this legislative session. So uh, it's just a matter of getting it on the priority list there. And we hope to see that letter soon. So on the main, very, very good uh, progress. Uh, and as the district manager says, uh, you know, we're moving at light speed relative to most community forest enterprises, but we're still in a, about an 18 month uh, game plan. Oh, one other note, uh, we will be applying under the new application process. That was something that we weren't sure about. And the government just released the new application process for community forest. So we were worried that we would be doing the work under the old application process and then having to apply under the new application process. That's been resolved because they finally did release the new application process. So we won't have to do you know, duplicate work or redundant work. Questions or comments on the community forest status? Okay, I'm not seeing any, so thank you. So then we'll move on to the first administrative uh, report from city manager and the downtown Cornell business improvement area bylaw. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So the purpose of this report is to request council to proceed with the third reading of the city of Cornell downtown Cornell business improvement bylaw number 1900 of 2020. Uh, this bylaw is a council initiatives bylaw subject to petition against. And it's interesting because this is one of those uh, bylaws that applies the dual 50-50 rule, where uh, if more than 50% of the properties representing more than 50% of the assessed value were to send us a note of objection to this, then we could not approve the bylaw as it sits. Uh, that did not happen. We sent out the letters to them, uh, to all the businesses, and we did receive some responses what are discussed in the background section of this report, but it was three businesses were opposed to this, to this uh, bylaw and representing 1.8% of the assessed value. So well under the threshold and their rationale and the reasons are attached in the letters attached to this report. Um, so the downtown BIA bylaw expired in 2020. The group came forward requesting a two year extension and a boundary expansion. After the first two readings, staff mailed out to the businesses in the respective BIA areas the budgets and plans with an estimate of the cost and instructions for the petition and the results of that petition as mentioned are attached. So the recommendation from for this report is that council rescind the second reading of the city of Cornell 
our the city of Cornell downtown business improvement bylaw 1900 to correct an error in the bylaw title and then proceed with the second reading again in the bylaw section of the agenda. But then that also council proceed with the third reading of the city of Cornell uh, downtown business improvement area bylaw 1900 in the bylaw section of the agenda. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So again, we'll just deal with the bylaw readings in the bylaw section. Are there any questions or comments on the report? Councilor Runge. Thank you. I just I just have a question and it and it's, and it begs, I guess, future letters that we get, because I love that we get these letters and that we can see the opposition and see what people are talking about. But I, I I'm I'm a little worried about uh, I'm wondering if we could redact names and you know identifying things in, in the public reports without blocking things out in, in the public domain, right? Because I, I just don't, I, I, you know, in the time of social shaming and stuff, I don't want anybody to feel bad about putting in a, a report like this or a letter like this, because it's, it's great for our council after you look at it and discuss things in. Yeah, I don't believe we can. City manager, I don't believe it's legal for us to do that. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And uh, Director Bolton is a is our FOI head, so she goes with the exact rules of when the redactions have to occur. But I think it's felt that it's important in this case that council really understands who those businesses are and and gets to see what their actual rationale is. And without the let without the names there, it's kind of you wouldn't be able to put those two together. But I think on on Council Runge's point, we should clarify because I believe in reverse petitions and so on, I think is an area that we don't, you know, people have to actually be named who are approved yeah. in yeah. the process, but we can See, get clarification on that. And also clarification with regards to the, uh, you know, because the, there's property identifiers and other types of things there. I'm, I'm okay with the people uh, in, in the letter. That's that, I'm just wondering if all the information has to be there. That was just my question, thank yeah, you. So we'll get clarity on exactly what uh, it needs to be declared, but I know there, there's a transparency component to reverse petition. Councillor Rudberg. Um, thank you. So just reading the letter um, that we received, I just want to make sure that she understands what, like she talks about this proposal. So I just wanted to make sure she understands what the process is moving forward. Because the way she's replied back, it doesn't under, It doesn't make me think she understands it's a taxation thing that will happen whether she agrees or not, like if it meets that threshold. So I'm not sure if somebody needs to just re, you know, kind of give her a heads an up about it. An explanatory letter went to every business. Uh, okay. Right? Every business got an explanatory letter, okay. what the process is, what the levy is, what it's used for. And okay, I just wanted to make sure she was clear. Yeah. All right, thank you. Okay. Any other questions or comments on the report? Okay, seeing none, we'll deal with the bylaws in the bylaw uh, section. Uh, so Amy, uh, Manager Reed can join us uh, for the operating agreement for Sprout Kitchen. Okay, thank you. Uh, the purpose of this report is to receive council approval to enter into two agreements with newly, the newly formed Sprout Kitchen Society. So there's an operating agreement for the Sprout Kitchen Food Hub, and then also a sublease agreement for 101 Marsh Drive. So the operating agreement outlines the responsibilities of Sprout Kitchen Society in order to achieve sustainability as outlined in the implementation plan and to meet the requirements of the funding provided by the province of British Columbia and Northern Development Initiative Trust. The operating agreement outlines the support of funding previously approved by council, so 15,000 uh, in each year and an additional 39,000 this year going until 2022 with no additional funding committed beyond 2022. The term of the operating agreement aligns with council's commitment to support operating costs plus one additional year and provides the option to extend until the end of the city's current lease agreement with the building owner. And then the lease agreement follows a similar format to the agreement between the city and the downtown association for the lease space at Spirit Center. The lease agreement term matches the term of the operating agreement with the option to extend to the end of the city's lease agreement with the building owner. Terms of the lease agreement match the terms of the agreement between the city and the building owner with the city subsidizing the lease costs in 2021 as outlined in the operating agreement. The sublease agreement may make the food hub space eligible for a permissive tax exemption. And that's really a big part of the reason of having this sublease agreement. 
and the city's lease agreement with the building owner requires that the city obtain permission from the building owner prior to subleasing the space and that permission is still pending. So there's two uh, separate recommendations, one for the operating agreement and one for the lease agreement. So let's, let's put the operating agreement on the table and then have the discussion and then we'll go to the lease agreement. So uh, can I have a motion for the recommendation on the operating agreement? Councillor uh, Elliott, so moved. Councillor Vic is, uh, sorry, Councillor Runge, am I seeing you seconding it? Okay. Uh, questions or comments on the operating agreement? Councillor Runge. Uh, thank you. And I think this uh, question might be to the city manager. On uh, page 23 of 61, um, point P, where we ensure that all commercial users have a city of Quinell business license. I, I'm not sure if in the farmer's market they have regional district uh, licenses. I, I'm just not sure because uh, so, so every business, like if they were a farmer coming from outside the boundary of Quinell would purchase a city uh uh, city business license? That's correct. Yeah, because they'll be doing business in the city of Cornell. So okay. if they're processing in the city, then they're doing business in the city of Cornell. Thank you. But as a commercial user, if you were a, a private person and it will be possible for a private person to go in and, and use the space for a fee. And if you're just doing that for your own personal use or to give away as gifts, you wouldn't require a business license. But if you're going to be selling product, you would require a business license. Thank you. Okay, other questions on the operating agreement? Seeing none, uh, any opposed to the recommendation? That's passed unanimously. Okay, and then on the recommendation for the lease uh, agreement, a motion, Councilor Rudenberg, so moved. Councilor Goulet, second. Any questions or comments on the lease agreement? Councilor Elliott. Yeah, if it's in the, <clears throat> excuse me, if it's in the report, then I apologize, but but under the lease agreement on the first page here on 2061, a sublease agreement may make the food hub space eligible for a permissive tax exemption. That's a little, I was kind of surprised at that because we can't have a permissive tax exemption on a leased property, but we can on a subleased. Can you explain that for me, please? So I, I think Director Bolton's probably the best one to explain this, sorry, but he's not sorry, here, yeah. so I'll, I'll, I can do my best. And I'm happy to talk to that. Sure. Thank you. Uh, so the, it's a very challenging issue we have there and it's BC assessment makes the rules of when a property is eligible for a permissive exemption. So we are working with our best understanding of what will fit the guidelines for a permissive exemption for this property. Because of course, the only taxes it's, or sorry, it's not just city taxes being avoided by a permissive exemption. It's all the other taxes which appear on the tax bill. So it is a benefit to the Sprout Kitchen. It's quite a substantial benefit to the Sprout Kitchen to get a permissive exemption. So we're working with whatever seems to be their requirement to give us the best chance of getting that. Having said that, they said they could not guarantee moving forward that this would always be eligible. They said it's a bit of a gray area within their own organization and they're working with this in other cities as well. So they said, do I have a separate sublease? Put it forward on that basis and we'll see how it goes. They thought pretty positive we could get that, so. And they agreed that it was similar to the QDA leasing or subleasing in the Spirit Center building. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions or comments on the lease uh, motion? Seeing none, anyone opposed? Seeing none, that motion's passed unanimously. Thank you, Amy. And Amy, uh, sorry, go ahead, Councilor Runge. Oh, no, this is for right after this, sorry. Okay. So Amy, maybe uh, we're just in the process of a press release going out. Maybe you just give a quick update of kind of timing and what things are gonna look like. Sure, so we'll have a news release uh, going out on Friday, uh, launching the, um, the website where users can actually go on and register to use the space. 
Um, our last piece, it, I was in there yesterday, it's, it's really coming together and we're gonna go in tomorrow morning to film a video tour of the space. Um, and our last piece is getting a connection for Fortis to our space that separates it from the rest of the building. So we're just waiting for the date on that. So that's the one thing that's pending. So I can't tell you exactly when people will be able to be in there actually using the space, but we're hoping um, also to set a date so that if council would like to tour the space, they can do so. And then um, our project manager, Amy Corey will be set setting up um, private tours with other businesses that want to cut like physically come in and take a look at the space before they commit, but we'll have that video tour out so anybody from the community can take a look and, and see if they're curious what is this sprout kitchen, what is this food hub, um, they'll be able to get a look in and see what it all looks like and what equipment we've got in there. Great. And, and one addition to Amy's update is there's also the NDI grant application going in for additional equipment and resources to even make it um, sort of a better, more robust enterprise than what uh, the current startup is, right? That's right. So we've got uh, an application pending. We'll know at the end of April whether or not that was successful um, after the board meeting. And um, so that will add to the equipment that's available. And then we're also in conversation with Red Cross about uh, a potential application where they would um, subsidize the 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 manager position of the space in that first year so that it uh, gives a full-time person when we don't quite have the clientele to cover the cost of a full-time person but you need that full-time person in the first year so that you can attract the clientele and bring them all on board so we're working with red cross on that good thank you councillor elliott did i see your hand yeah yeah thank you mr mayor and just very briefly um, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention uh, publicly that I've received a couple of comments about uh, how hard Amy Reed has been working on this and how positive it is, it's been. So I just wanted to make sure to mention that. You could do it in a more buoyant manner. Like, I really I'm, would like to make I'm that pumped known. I'm about this. And there Amy, you rock. There we go. <laughs> thank you. Well, I have a good team, but thank you. Yeah, thanks, Amy, for your leadership on this file. Okay, we've taken the votes. We've got a little bit of an update. Council Runge? Oh, we'll take the vote. Sorry. I thought we took no, we the did. vote already. Yeah, we've done all that. We're just yeah, so, so, so I have a point of order, I, I believe, I, I, on the city manager's report. I don't think we voted on those on those motions. So that's a bylaw. Well, don't we have to vote on the bylaws? In the bylaw section. In the bylaw section. Um, my apologies. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, next, thank you, uh, Amy. Uh, and next, if uh, Bart Schneider can uh, join us. <laughs> Are you still our fire chief? Like I thought, I thought we said yes to your replacement already. <laughs> no, you said yes to my replacement, but I'm still in the chair for another couple of months. And obviously incognito because we're all seeing your name as Bart Schneider. So you better introduce yourself to us before you do your report then. Yeah, I'm using his, uh, I'm using his iPad. So that's the reason why. <laughs> all right, uh, go, go ahead, Director Gossi. I'm working on my next position. So it's already losing all my hair. <laughs> so thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of council. The purpose of this report is to request council's approval for the renewal of the fire protection agreement with the Lataco Denny Nation. Uh, just a quick background, the City of Cornell Fire Department has had a fire protection agreement with uh, the Tequidani Nation since the early 1980s. When the last agreement was written in 2010, uh, we did make one major changes to the agreement in which that we would only provide structural fire protection. Uh, anything with grass fire or wildfire would still be the uh, responsibility of the uh, Ministry of Natural Land and Forest. And if they're unable to respond to a grass fire, then they would call us. And then when our fire department through the city, we would be able to invoice uh, Ministry of Natural Resources, which we have done about six or seven times over the last few years. Also, over the past few years, we have seen a lot of new construction on the Leteco Denny Nation land, mainly new residences, which uh, does significantly increase the value of the structures at risk. Uh, talking about that also, the last increase for the fire protection services, which were made in 2010, was the cost that was set as $3,000 a year. 
which has been set at $3,000 a year since 2010. So the proposed new agreement will see a rise in cost to $5,000 a year, which does reflect the value of all the new construction that have occurred over the past few years and all the new constructions that are taking place as we speak. Financial implication, none from the city. Uh, the Taco Nation uh, does agree to pay the city of Cornell $5,000 a year for a fire protection agreement. Uh, there's three options that we can go with. Uh, either uh, council approve the renewal of the Lateco Denny Nation Fire Protection Agreement as written and provided to council. That council direct the director of emergency services to make changes as per council's wishes. Or lastly, leave the agreement as was written in 2010 with a $3,000 fee. Recommendation that council approve the renewal for the Lateco Denny Nation Fire Protection Agreement as written and provided to council and that the mayor and corporate administrator be authorized to execute such documentation as required to complete the agreement. And I see Councillor Elliott hand up for moving, Councillor Paul seconding. Any questions or comments? Seeing none, uh, anyone opposed? No one opposed, that motion has ca uh, passed unanimously. Uh, and thank you, uh, Fire Chief Goche. Uh, for your service. You're I welcome. We're going to do something on your way out the door, but if I could suggest as one other bald guy, like another job with a hat uh, would be good. We're so used to you walking around with a nice hat on that covers that bald pate, right? So oh. anyway, thank you. Oh, yeah. wait, here you go. There. <laughs> the helmet. I have one. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you, Sylvan. Appreciate you spending some time with us tonight. Yeah. Have a nice evening. Okay. Uh, next report, the OCP zoning amendment, vacant land on Hoy. Director Turner, you can show us your smiling face. There we go. Thank you, Mayor. The purpose of this report is a discussion of the zoning amendment on Hoy Street for the NASCO First Nation housing project. On February 16th, council was provided a report outlining the intention of the NASCO Indian Band to make an application to amend the zoning of lands on Hoy Street to allow for the NASCO First Nation River Rock development. This proposal includes two fourplexes and as well as a single duplex for a total of 10 units on the subject site. Uh, on February 16th, council did give direction on who was to be consulted and notices were sent out to the Caribou Regional District, School District 28, the Taco Diné Nation, Luskus Diné Nation, Esde La First Nation, Southern Dekesh Nation Alliance, Northern Health and West Quinell Business Association. Correspondent supporting the development proposal was received from the school district and that was re received earlier as council will remember that was actually in the first report to council um, as well as Northern Health uh, has also now uh, provided a or sorry Northern Health originally uh, put a, a, a statement in the school district's uh, support letter is attached. The um, this will be the first virtual public hearing for council and you will find attached to this pro uh, to this uh, application, the process. And I really want to just highlight that out there for council to kind of review that process. Uh, we we are, will be putting that out on the website. We have attached it to the notices and as well in the newspaper notices, we will also be stating that uh, where the uh, public can find information on how the process will work. So we are fairly confident we're getting that information out there. Uh, for for council, it will be a, a very interesting process. I know the school, or the uh, regional district, has done a few um, virtual meetings already, and I've been in discussions with them, and they've had uh, um, they've had uh, a good success. They're doing teleconferences. We're going to be doing something a little different, so um, in terms of having a Zoom as well as the ability to call in. But we're looking forward to uh, the opportunity to consult the public in this matter and uh, have our first session. Uh, for council, the recommendation is that council provides in the bylaw section of the agenda, second reading to official community plan amendment bylaw number 1903 and zoning amendment bylaw number 1904 to amend the zoning of the subject properties on Hoy Street, RM3, which is high density residential, as per the application file OCP rezone 2021-34 River Rock. Okay, and again, we'll deal with the actual vote and bylaw in the bylaws section. Any questions or comments? In this case, on either 
uh, the OCP zoning amendment report or the virtual public hearing documentation. I'm not seeing any hands. Okay, thank you, Director Turner. We'll deal with the bylaw in that section. And I would suggest uh, council take a good look at the public hearing. And if you do have questions or queries, I know Ms. Hartley's working on it with uh, Director Turner and either one uh, can uh, you know deal with your questions uh, leading up to that process. Okay. Good, thank you. Council information package, let's, uh, uh, we've received the package. Uh, so we'll turn our attention to the uh, item that Councillor Paul wanted brought forward, which is the letter from MP Doherty. Go ahead, Councillor Paul. Uh, yes, thank you. I, I don't have the letter in front of me, uh, but I do recall that, um, that MP Doherty is looking for uh, support from not only the city of Quinnell, but other other municipalities. And uh, I'd like to, to move that we do send a letter in support of uh, establishing the three digit suicide prevention hotline. Okay, uh, so that you're putting that forward as a motion, Councillor Paul? Yes, I am. Okay, secondary, I think I saw Councillor Vic put his hand up. Any questions or comments? Okay, so a letter of support for MP Doherty's initiative. Uh, anyone opposed? Seeing none, that motion has carried unanimously. Thank you, Councillor Paul. And thank you, Council. Okay, uh, next we have some uh, correspondence. A couple of them are, are for information for Council. So the very first one is the timeline for casino openings. And of course, as one of the communities with a casino, uh, we've been working uh, with the casino operators to try and understand you know, where they're at. Uh, and of course, uh, Dr. Bonnie Henry indicated some time ago that casinos would be something that she would consider as a late uh, restart. Uh, but as you'll see in the letter, it's, it's basically saying, okay, so what is the process and how do we get into a dialogue about some timing uh, around this? Uh, so that letter's for information for council. Uh, any questions or comments about that? Councillor Paul? Uh, yeah, I understand that it's for, for for our information, but it certainly wouldn't hurt if we were to send a letter in support of the um, the sentiments of um, the mayor of the city of Langley. Yeah, so we did sign a letter, um, and I don't think we've got the copy of the letter that I signed. We were at all the mayors, so this is an illustrative letter. The mayors of communities with casinos sent letters in, so there's one under my signature as well. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. On the next page. Sorry, is it? Page some 50. are working from electronic versions and some are working from hard copies. Page 50 of 61, Mr. Mayor, is the list of the mayors who uh, sent in, who signed off on that. Yeah, so I, I'm listed here, but I, I think my electronic signature went on a version, didn't it? They chose not to do that. They just made a oh, list of okay. those supporting, yep. Okay, I had I had originally understood that we would be putting individual letters in with electronic signatures on it, but as you can see, we've just signed off on this. Councillor Paul. Yeah, I just noticed that uh, the letter from the the mayor of the city of Langley that our own MLA Oaks is not copied on that, so I wonder if somebody could uh, maybe send a letter over to her so that she, that completes the list. Uh, yeah, we can make sure that. She's seen it if she hasn't already. Okay, uh, anything else on that item? Okay, the other is again, an information item for council and it's a request for feedback. I'm going to suggest uh, that uh, council give some thought to this and that the finance committee potentially uh, collect that. But uh, as you'll see, it's a fee increase uh, proposed uh, for the uh, NCLGA. Uh, and a rationale and an invitation uh, to give some feedback uh, on uh, the fee structure. Uh, are there any comments or suggestions uh, by council members just now uh, before we craft a response? Councillor Paul? Yes, thank you. It would be helpful to know um, when the last fee increase was implemented. Okay. Any other thoughts or suggestions? 
Councillor Elliott. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So do, do you want this on the next agenda then for FSAC? Well, I thought, I mean, I think it should come from one of our committees that we send, we re actually respond uh, okay. to this, but if council member doesn't have, you know, if we're fine with the fee increase other than when did they increase it last time, then I think we just say, yeah, okay. Councillor Rudenberg. Um, to answer Councillor Paul's uh, query, it has been a very long time. It's one of those pieces that I think they've become a victim of their own. Well, you know what? We're not going to increase your fees this year. So it's been since before I was president of NCLJ. So it's been, it's probably between, I would say five and 10 years since they've increased fees. Thank, thank you for that. And, and um, I was kind of expecting that kind of an answer. So um, maybe the, the increase is justified. And, and for reference for council, uh, the fees, because UBCM is the other one that we pay, and I, I thought that council members may have a question uh, around that. So I asked Director Bolton, and I thought I had it in my notes here. I think it's around six dollars $6,500 uh, we pay. I just can't see it uh, right there. So just a heads up for council members, I'm involved in a lot of, you know, mayor's calls on specific issues. Uh, and, uh, you know, a lot of the mayors are challenging directly the value that their communities are getting from these area associations and UBCM uh, and really calling in the question. So for example, where, what, you know, where's UBCM being in the whole COVID scene early on when we were asking for supports, we saw FCM, but uh, UBCM was relatively quiet. We understood they were having ongoing dialogue uh, with government, but it wasn't necessarily flowing to us. Dialogue around RCMP uh, and the RCMP funding formula, issues like that. Uh, and it's a function and all I'm doing is reflecting the discussion around mayor's tables. It's a function of often these area associations and UBCM have a preponderance of, you know, voting from um, uh, area directors uh, from regional districts that don't have the same issues that we necessarily have at the municipal uh, level. Uh, so through that lens, uh, you know, I think council on an annual basis just pays these fees, uh, but, uh, you know, I can reflect to council, there is a lot of dialogue about the value of these organizations, and maybe these organizations need to look at themselves through that value proposition. So are they delivering value uh, to their member organizations? Are they lobbying for the right things? I see your hand, Council Paul. Are they, uh, you know, they're their process uh, for resolutions uh, has always been, you know, suspect in terms of prioritization and getting a, some kind of priority list in front of government uh, and so on. So that dialogue is quite alive uh, when we have these mayors uh, discussions on specific issues at this time, public safety being one of the number one uh, issues. Councilor Paul, I saw your hand. There we go. Uh, a double barrel question. Are we a member of the Federation of Canadian Municipalities? We are not. Okay, thank you. And um, I guess the other part of my question would be that when we were going through the budget, I noticed that there was a line item for memberships and subscriptions, and I know that it went up by a modest amount. And um, it would be helpful to be able to see that list and see indeed what we subscribe to and, and, and all what we are members of. Yeah, and Councillor Paul, that list is available at any time during the budget process for council members to query. I know in my first term, we looked at it a couple of times and brought it to council and asked some questions around it. So that list can be generated uh, if you're interested. Uh, uh, Director Bolton can provide it to you. Could I put in that request right now, please? Sure. And have it put in my box. Yeah, we can provide it to all of council. Thank you. Okay, any other questions or comments, Councilor Rudenberg? Thank you. Um, so you're quite correct, Mayor Simpson, around the dialogue that is happening out there about what, what, um, what each um, local government level deals with. 
I know that at NCLGA, they're looking at changing what the uh, board table looks like. And so that's something to really pay attention to because they're looking at, it's the regional districts that are speaking out quite loudly at NCLGA. So it's just something to, to be paying attention to at the conference because they're going to look at changing what the board table looks like. Um, and I find that really interesting because they talk about, you know, um, municipalities having the major voice at that table. And that's not really true when you look at how that board is made up. So just something to be paying attention to when NCLJ sends out their, their information because they're looking at, they ask for some feedback on what you, what we thought as members should be the makeup of the board. And the whole piece around the process for resolutions we get that. And I know that uh, last year there was supposed to be a start of a process with the uh, president of uh, UBCM going around to every area association meeting talking about uh, how we want to change the process for resolutions because we get it. 220 resolutions that go to UBCM, like really? Like the government's not going to listen at, for at 220 resolutions. We totally get that. And so I know that, you know, we've tried to put pressure on the area associations to streamline their asks and make sure that they're more of a global ask than a, an area ask. And we're still looking at how we change that process for resolutions because it isn't effective. How do we, as a resolution driven board, how do we present those those pieces to government if we have 220 resolutions that we're supposed to be bringing forward and so um it's a piece that um is being looked at quite um quite honestly and it and people are struggling with it because there are still members of the board who want to keep it the same because they feel every member has the right to put a resolution forward if they want and then there's those of us or those people on the board who feel we're not effective if we're dealing with 220 resolutions. And I mean, and that number changes, but that's lately, that's been the average. And so, um, yeah, it's, a, it's an ongoing process. And because we're resolution driven, that's where our lobbying goes. So just to let you know that there are a lot of these issues that are being looked at and we're trying to get, I mean, again, it's not just up to the board to change these things. It has to be changed from our members. Yeah, and I, and, I, and I appreciate those reflections back to council, but I, you know, I think the other piece of it, it's not a but, it's an and, is some of the emergent issues that are highly sensitive and need the attention of government are in the municipalities. Uh, and it's where the worlds really divide when you're dealing with downtown core issues, you're dealing with you know, some of the public safety issues, uh, the harm reduction strategy issues and so on, housing issues, you know, all poverty reduction issues, et cetera. None of that is in the domain of a regional district director uh, that, that has a sparse population distributed over a large geography, no infrastructure to maintain because the province maintains it all, et cetera, right? So I think that that's where the worlds really divide. And that's where the mayors are articulating where, you know, one conversation I had where, you know, a number of the mayors said, we don't want NCLGA or UBCM anywhere near this. We don't want them representing us on this issue because we need to have that direct relationship uh, with the province to get this issue addressed. So it's something I think we need to be aware of. And often what we do is just say yes to the fee structure without, to your point, Council Rudenberg, engaging in making these organizations as effective as we need them to be. So that that collective voice of local government is focused, targeted and strategic when it goes to the province, okay? Councillor Elliott. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, just briefly, because you, you really did touch on it. Uh, and to Councillor Rudenberg's point as well, I'm glad that they're having the conversations about the, the possibility of restructuring because, because quite honestly, you know, I'm not sure of the value coming out of NCLGA at times. Um, I, I get what's happening. I get what the resolution's coming forward and, and things like this, but I think the mayor's point of of government being succinct with with the ministers and and talking about our specific issues is a lot more valuable potentially i'm trying to be really polite here than than going through uh 
situation of 220 different resolutions every year and and listening to some of the same people talk about every resolution that comes forward so yeah it'll be interesting to see to see how it works i've always been one to to push hard for nclga and and ubcm but you know times are could be changing and the value for me really is knowing where we're going, what direction we have to go in and who we have to have these conversations with. So at UBCM, for example, we're spending all that time with the ministers and, and not many are, are going with the resolutions, but that's just, I'll be interested to see where we go. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So effectively just on the item itself, I'm not hearing any of the council members balking at the need to adjust the fees to councillor Paul's point and Councilor Rudenberg's edification, they haven't been changed for a long time. We all know all costs are incrementing. So unless I see otherwise, uh, we'll make arrangements whenever they issue the new fee structure to incorporate it into our budget. Uh, having said that, um, city manager, if we could just get that list out, uh, you know, through uh, Ms. Hartley or through Director Bolton uh, of what that membership's line item uh, is uh, and that way we can clarify because I do believe uh, we withdrew funding from FCM because nobody was really going there. We wanted to focus our attention on uh, the local area association and UBCM, but we can get that clarification. Okay, anything else on this item? Okay, uh, the final item is is the letter uh, that uh, was the late agenda item. Uh, and that was uh, with respect to the financial support for Barkerville. Uh, and you can see that we are weighing in uh, on uh, that to the Premier and asking for the long-term sustainable funding for Barkerville and for all the reasons why that's important to us. Any questions or comments on that? It's an information item only. Okay, uh, we're good to move on then. All right, so the bylaw readings, Quinnell Downtown Business Association Improvement Area Bylaw, rescind second reading, second as amended, uh, and third reading. So three different things. Councillor Paul, Councillor Vic, any questions or comments? All in favor? Sorry, anyone opposed? Keep consistency. Uh, seeing no one opposed, uh, that is unanimous. Uh, bylaw 1903 with respect to Hoy Street, the official community plan amendment uh, on second reading. Councillor Elliott, uh, so moved. Councillor Runge, second. Uh, any comments? Anyone opposed? Seeing none, that passed unanimously. And the zone amendment bylaw for the same uh, property, second reading. Mm -hmm. Councillor Elliott, so moved. Councillor Rudenberg, second. Questions or comments? Anyone opposed? That passed uh, unanimously. Uh, no changes to upcoming meeting schedules or committee appointments, any announcements or future events. I'm not seeing any indication of any. There are is no future, as I said last time in COVID, for events. Uh, <laughs> so gallery questions. See, yeah, uh, just a really quick one. Um, yes, go ahead. When it comes to the bathrooms, when can we expect to see those installed? It'll be in our spring build cycle. City manager, that would be something that Matt, uh, our public works director, should be able to give Cassidy a bit of a time frame. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. My understanding is it's going to be later. It's going to be fallish by the time they're actually installed. But I, I'll be happy to point, uh, or I'll ask Matt that specific question and have him uh, talk to you, Cassidy, and send you a note. No problem, thanks. And I'm I'm really looking forward to uh, Sprout Kitchen opening uh, later this week, or, or not opening, but getting off the ground later this week. Yeah, we're all looking forward to that too. It's been a long time coming. Any other questions? Seeing none, uh, I'd invite a motion to adjourn. Councillor Elliott, so moved. Councillor Run, second. Any questions or comments about adjourning this meeting? Again, thank you everybody uh, for the work uh, that you all do and the contribution to our community and to our staff uh, for all their hard work. Have a good evening. Oh wait, anybody opposed to adjournment? <laughs> Not likely. Uh, Councillor Paul, you were waving. I was waving goodbye. Oh, okay. <laughs> I thought you were catching me on the fact I didn't take the vote. <laughs> no, no, no.
All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone.